Hi, I'm Dustin with ProAV School. In today's video, I'm going to show Crestron programmers how you can use crosspoints to make your programming better. This actually came from a course I created called the TLDR method. I did a whole module about crosspoints and I thought that it would be useful for everybody to be able to see this because it really helps kind of strategizing how you can use control crosspoints and equipment crosspoints and some ideas on how to connect them together. Cross points are one of the few truly dynamic building blocks that we have in our simple programming toolbox. The connectivity between components of your code is changeable at runtime, allowing a lot of flexibility for systems that need to change on the fly. This allows you to create complex, combinable room systems, as well as build up programs like the TLDR residential framework. You can think of a cross point essentially as an enhanced buffer that allows signals to pass between various paths. The enhancement part is that they are addressable and connections can be managed at runtime. A crosspoint connection handles a bunch of digital, analog, and serial strings together. Let's look at the components that make up a crosspoint connection. There are two main building blocks, the control crosspoint and the equipment crosspoint. Typically, the control crosspoint connects to the user interface and the equipment crosspoint connects to a device. Data flowing between the two is actually bi-directional. Once a connection between a pair is established, what goes in one side comes out the other. The crosspoint connect symbol is what makes and breaks the crosspoint connections. Each instance of this symbol can make and break any crosspoint connection in your program. The global control capability of the crosspoint connect symbol makes it powerful, but also a bit easy to abuse. I try to avoid using the disconnect all function in my programs, as you can affect connections inside modules or also in your program that you may not even be aware of. The main rule you must follow when connecting crosspoints is that control crosspoints must be connected to an equipment crosspoint. Aside from that, you can connect many control crosspoints to one equipment crosspoint or many equipment crosspoints to one control crosspoint. Any crosspoint pair connecting together will pass signals back and forth just as if they were buffered together. Now it is worth noting that the jamming behavior for digital signals is actually a bit different than you might expect and I had to try this out to really understand it myself. For example, imagine that you have two control crosspoints connected to the same equipment crosspoint. You may think that a digital signal held high on one of the control crosspoints would block the other control crosspoints from passing any changes through the same digital join number. This is how it would work with the buffer. In reality, crosspoints actually pass the last change through. In this example, you would in fact see the change from the second control crosspoint even if the first is held high. The transition from low to high of crosspoint 2 won't pass a change, but once it goes low, the output of the equipment crosspoint will follow. Analog and serial signals simply pass the last change through regardless of what connected control crosspoint it came from, so the behavior is what you would expect. There are some considerations regarding analog signal propagation when crosspoint connections are made. I'll talk about this more in a bit. Depending on your programming style, you might want to centralize all the connections through one crosspoint connect symbol or have them distributed throughout your program. In the TLDR method, we tend to put a crosspoint connect symbol in each area where things need to connect so that they essentially manage their own connections. You can see an example of this in the TLDR room.umc module for the video connection. In this case, we connect to a new video switcher when the ID of the video switcher equipment ID is changed. This change really only happens once when the module is first initialized. Connections are made by referring to the control ID of the crosspoint symbols. The control ID is a regular 16-bit integer. This is usually expressed as 1 to 65,535 decimal. You can express the ID using hexadecimal number if you want. For some reason, the parameter properties indicate that the control ID can be a 32-bit integer, but this is actually incorrect and will generate compile errors. The ID number is unique for the control and equipment crosspoint symbol types. You can't have more than one control crosspoint with the same ID or more than one equipment crosspoint with the same ID. If there are any duplicate crosspoint IDs in the program, you'll actually get an error when you compile the program. You may not realize at first, but the control and equipment crosspoints each have their own range. This means it is valid for a control crosspoint and an equipment crosspoint to actually have the same ID. The reason a lot of people avoid crosspoints altogether are the challenges they come with. Crosspoints are a bit tricky to establish and manage the connections. Troubleshooting can become a little bit more convoluted and confusing. In addition, they can make your code harder to follow because you can't easily trace what is supposed to be connected by just looking at the simple code. 
Using cross points effectively requires you to have some strategies at your disposal for dealing with what I would consider the three main challenges. Connections, passing analog values, and effective troubleshooting. First, let's look at a couple of strategies for establishing crosspoint connections and disconnecting them when they are no longer needed. By default, I've seen a lot of people use steppers to set a control ID, equipment ID, then pulse connect. This works, but it tends to introduce a bit of code smell that I keep talking about. If anything needs to be adjusted in the future, this connection method can break and cause you troubleshooting headaches because it wasn't really as dynamic as it could have been. In a typical system, you might have a control cross point connected to signals from a touch panel, and then an equipment cross point in a number of room logic locations. When you select a new room, the system would disconnect all equipment IDs from the control cross point and then connect it to the requested equipment ID. We can do this very cleanly and dynamically using a serial analog logic wave pulse or speed key saw pulse. The room select analog value drives the input. On the outputs, we use the regular output to drive the disconnect and the inverted out star to drive the connect. This will wait for a change in the analog and immediately disconnect from the old equipment cross point and then connect to the new equipment cross point. This connection happens fast, requiring only two logic waves. A more advanced connection strategy that you'll see in the touch panel's global module of the residential framework involves connecting to a list of cross points in sequence. This works well for programs where you want to connect one or a series of control cross points to a series of equipment cross points. I have to give credit to the guys at a Crestron service provider dealership named Adelite. They developed an open source simple framework called Crescendo. In their framework, they have a method like this, and I was impressed with the elegance of the solution. I used a similar method when building the TLDR residential framework. Let's take a look at the touch panel globals module and see how this works. In this module, we initialize a serialized list of cross points to connect to. We're using hexadecimal numbers, which makes it easier to split the list into bite-sized chunks without having to build a way to parse it out. This makes things a little bit more convoluted, but in this case, it is wrapped inside a module. Once it is tested, it shouldn't be something you need to mess around with. A serial substring is used next to pull off the first character from the list. This goes into a serial to analog symbol, which extracts the analog value. A scaler is used to add an offset of 400 for the equipment ID. Another scaler takes the analog value and adds an offset of 700 for the control ID. When the equipment ID changes, this triggers a serial analog logic wave pulse to make the first cross point connection. Remember that serial substring signal? We actually have another one running beside it that extracts the remainder of the serialized list with the first character removed. This is fed back into the first serial substring through a serial buffer, which delays it by one logic wave. This collection of logic modules does its own little loop, pulling characters off the serialized list one after the other and connecting to them in sequence. The loop continues until it reaches the end. The connection happens fast. We're talking about one logic wave per ID in the list. You could also use this method dynamically at runtime by feeding in different connection strings. This would be impossible with the stepper method. The second major challenge when using cross points is dealing with the nature of analog signals. This also affects serial signals that are set as permanent strings, but this usually doesn't create the types of problems that analogs do. Let's look at an example. Say you have a volume slider on a touch panel and connect that to different rooms with cross points so that the user can select a room to control. The analog volume from your interface goes through a control cross point to get to a room. As soon as you connect to a new room, the analog value sitting at the control cross point would immediately be pushed through. This would force the new room to set its volume to the value of the last room. One way to handle analog signals through cross points is to make use of the inter-system communication symbol in a unique way. This symbol is actually designed for communication between systems. I usually just refer to this as XSIG since that is the speed key for the symbol. It operates in pairs, so you need two of them. Each side can encode digital and analog signals into a transmitted serial stream and also decode them from a received serial stream. In this application, we only care about the analog signals, and you can use this even if only one analog is needed. We simply pass an analog signal into an XSIG and connect the serial output to a cross point. This means that the serial string is sent out on the change of an analog signal. In our example, connecting to a new room would not cause the current value from the touch panel to propagate. It would only do that after a new change. Since you would drive the slider feedback from the room 
through the cross point, it would be updated to the proper value of whatever room is selected, and then changes would be made from that point. In this example, we are using xsig to pass the analog value of the serial through the cross points. When we connect to a room, no volume level is sent right away, and the touch panel's volume slider is updated by feedback from the room. When the slider is adjusted from the new current level, the new values will get propagated through the serial stream and then updated in the room. Remember in the last example, whatever level that slider had would be pushed into the room right away before even getting its current level. You can see here, when we break the connection to room one and then connect to room two, the current level in room two will get pushed back through and update the touch panel slider. Now, when we adjust from that new level, it will again get propagated through and adjust the room. If we had used analogs through the cross points, like in the previous example, as I'll show you here, the moment we connect to room two, it is set to whatever level the slider is currently at. Another method for analogs is what I like to call the pull-push method. I'll use the same example, but we won't use xsig. In this case, what we do is pull the current level feedback from the room before allowing changes from the panel to push to the room. This is accomplished by using a simple analog buffer between the touch panel volume set and control cross point. This buffer would be disabled upon initial connection and enabled after a logic wave has pulsed. You can use the in-use digital feedback signal from a control cross point going into a logic wave delay to drive this enable signal. Basically, upon connection, the current level of the new room is sent to the slider on the touch panel and then the control buffer is enabled. Any changes from that point are new level adjustments and sent to the room. As I was going through and editing this, I realized I missed something about cross points as well. In the residential framework, rather than sending the analog values for audio through the cross points, I'm actually sending digital presses up, down, and mute toggle. So if you do it that way, you also don't have the problem of passing the analog values. So basically when this is connected out to, to a different room, it's just pressing, sending the presses. And then in the room here, you see they're coming in, sorry, that's the wrong spot, in from the touch panel. These presses are just coming into the room. And at that point, that's where it's adjusting the actual volume. The third major challenge with cross points involves troubleshooting. If you open up a simple program that has implemented a bunch of cross points, you can't exactly see what is supposed to be connected together. The simple compiler has an option under compiler settings to generate cross point routing file. I believe this is checked by default. The list it generates lets you see how many cross points are defined, what their ID numbers are, and where they are in the program. This is handy, but it still doesn't tell you how things are connected because this is determined at runtime. The easiest way to understand how the program is structured is to actually load a compiled version onto a test processor. At runtime, there's a console command that tells you everything you need to know about what connections are made and which cross points are defined. The cross point troubleshooting command you need to know about is route sim stat. It defaults to a program running on program slot 1. If you are on a different program slot, use route sim stat colon program ID. For example, route sim stat colon 2. You can see it generates a list of all the cross points and indicates active connections. They actually show it in two ways, so this listing is a bit confusing to look at. Sometimes I will copy the list and paste it into a text editor so I can analyze it a bit better. There are some arguments that you can supply to the route simstat command. Adding minus C colon and then giving a control ID will filter the list showing you only that control ID. You can do the same thing to filter equipment IDs with minus E colon and then the equipment ID. Before we end this section, I want to talk a little bit about some other ways cross points can be used. Layering cross points allows you to bring data into a central block of code and then connect out to specific rooms. I use this in room combined systems where touch panels each connect to a room logic block through a control and equipment cross point pair. Next, Based on the combination mode of the rooms, the room logic is connected to a specific room's devices with another set of cross points. This allows me to swap out 
where the touch panels are connected to, which makes it really easy to synchronize their operation if desired. Cross points can also be used to bring data into a module without having to define pathways in the module's arguments. To make it modular, we can use parameter substitution to pass a unique cross point ID from the module parameters. This will let you have multiple instances of the same module in a program, each containing unique cross points. Thanks for watching the video, and I hope it really helped you kind of conceptualize how cross points can be used. You don't have to use them, but knowing that they exist and knowing some strategies on how you can implement them, I think can be really helpful for you in your programming career. If you have any comments, please leave them below. I read all the comments. I like to engage in conversation there. Um, please feel free to check out the course at tldrmethod.com. It's just part of Pro EV School. And please remember to like this video if you like it and uh, subscribe to the channel so you can see notifications of when we release new videos. Thanks and have a great day.